Hi everyone, welcome back to ESG Decoded. I'm your host, Caitlin Allen, and today we are going to be talking about the California Climate Accountability Act. Specifically, we'll be diving into SB 253, the Climate Corporate Data Accountability Act, and SB 261, the Climate Related Financial Risk Act. And I have invited a couple of panelists um, to talk about this. Um, first, I'd like to introduce to you Nico Van Alstein, who's a partner at Shepard Mullen based in the firm San Francisco office. Nico has more than 25 years of environmental consulting and litigation experience. He is well known for his international work to advance voluntary carbon offset markets and is a founding member of the firm's ESG and sustainability team. I won't say more because I want Nico to share his fascinating career story, but first, welcome Nico to the podcast. Uh, thank you, Caitlin. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, our second panelist today is David Prieto, who is a now returning uh, guest on the podcast. Um, David is our Senior Director of Climate and Energy Advisory at Climco, and he's going to help us dive into some of the more specific reporting requirements of these bills and um, uh, participate in the discussion. So David, thank you for being here again. Caitlin, thanks for having me, and Nico, look forward to this discussion. And so I've teased Nico's career story and won't keep you all waiting longer. <laughs> so please, Nico, tell us how you came to be uh, an environmental attorney um, in this field. Um, well, I actually have a lifelong interest in environmental matters. I became interested as a child walking, watching Jacques Cousteau, if you can believe that. I'm dating myself when I say that. Um, and I went off to college and... Um, uh, and I got, it wasn't a major at my college, Williams College, um, but it was a minor, a coordinated study, they called it, in environmental studies. So that was a focus of mine from early on. And I, I so I did a joint major in environmental studies and political philosophy, wrote a thesis about some of those issues. And then I went to, I chose a law school that um, had a strong environmental program at yeah, the University of Oregon. Uh, I'm a, or from Oregon originally as well, so that was nice. So I've long had an interest in environmental law, and I had a particular interest in international uh, environmental law and climate issues, but um, it, trying to make a living doing that was very difficult uh, in the 80s and 90s. Um, so uh, I put those interests on the back burner, as it were, and focused on more traditional environmental law matters. Um, here in, in California. Um, but with the adoption of AB 32 in 2006, um, I was able to move back to my, uh, you know, real interest, which has been the case since I was a child, which is in international and particularly climate issues. And I've been focusing on those for a little over 15 years now. So cool. I wanted to prompt, you know, I think there's some a stat about you that you've been the key representative for every case against the car, the clap cap and trade program. Is well, right? I might like to think of myself as the key representative, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure others would say that. But I have had a role in every lawsuit challenging California's cap and trade program, um, often representing um, the uh, AIDA, the International Emissions Trading Association, either as an amicus or as an intervener. We did intervene in, in several cases. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of that work. Most recently, we uh, intervened on behalf of AIDA and the business community to ensure that that voice was heard in the lawsuit that the Trump administration brought against the state of California, contending that California as a state was engaging in unconstitutional uh, international diplomatic relations uh, in violation of the treaty clause of the U.S. Constitution, which was really a fascinating um, uh, case because you know we were literally uh, citing case law and authorities from the 1700s um, and the 1800s. Uh, the compact clause, which was the primary argument that they were arguing, requires that for any state to enter into an agreement with a foreign jurisdiction. Um, and in this case, California and Quebec for its cap and trade program, that that requires the uh, consent of Congress. And it's pretty well safe. I mean, that is what the language says, um, but it has been interpreted uh, more differently for uh, more broadly for well over 100 years. The only the only case in which the a violation of the compact clause has been upheld was the Confederacy from the Civil War. 
that was deemed to be an, uh, an improper non-constitutional compact. So we, we helped the state of California successfully defend that lawsuit, uh, which was quite interesting. We also filed an amicus brief in the auctions case, um, contending that, uh, and made the argument, which the court picked up on, that um, the auctions of allowances under California's cap and trade program are not an illegal tax under California law, because while they are not property vis-a-vis -vis the holder of a compliance allowance and the state, because they are compliance obligations, um, they are property as between private parties, hence they can be bought and sold. Um, and, and parties have a choice whether to buy those allowances at the auction or buy them on the market, and therefore it's not a tax. Interestingly, um, the uh, Pennsylvania just uh, last week uh, reached a different conclusion uh, with regard to the Reggie program. So it's um, it's an, it's a, it continues to be a live issue when it comes to emissions trading. Super interesting, Nico. Um, for a little bit of background for those who aren't familiar with Shepard Mullen, would you like to tell us just a tiny bit about the firm um, before we dive deep in? Sure. Um, Shepard Mullen is a, we're an AMLAW 50 law firm. Um, we have um, eight offices across the United States from San Diego to New York, um, as well as four abroad. I've actually spent quite a bit of time the last few years in our London office. We also have two offices in Southeast Asia. Um, it's a full service firm. We, we do it all. I should note, um, you mentioned before the our ESG and sustainability group, uh, of which I'm one of the co-leaders, not the leader. Um, and we that group focuses on 10 different aspects of ESG, covering each of the three letters in ESG. Um, one that I really am proud of and want to just give a shout out to is our financing of green energy and infrastructure and project development. Um, we have over 65 attorneys dedicated to renewable energy uh, project development, financing, um, maintenance, development, et cetera. Um, and have been doing that work for over 30 years. Just last year alone, we were involved with investments uh, concerning the development of our 14 gigawatts of renewable electricity, renewable energy. So that's that's a major focus uh, of our firm, and, and we do quite we're one of the major players in that space. Um, and then the carbon space, of course, that's where I'm more active. Okay, let's dive into the big topic at hand. So. The recently signed California Climate Accountability Act, this package of bills that addresses greenhouse gas and climate risk disclosure. Um, we're going to get more into the basis for those and some of the reporting frameworks later, but let's start with just an overview. So what's, you know, if you had to give us the nutshell version, what is the high level description of SB 253 and 261? Um, uh, how would you describe them, Nico? Well, let's begin with SB 261, the Climate Related Financial Risk Act. And it is just what the name suggests. It requires uh, corporations, or I should say any kind of company um, with revenue over $500,000, annual revenue of over $500,000 worldwide to, um, to disclose and file this, uh, to its, um, its, its analysis of its climate related financial risk and its plans for mitigating and addressing that risk. And those requirements kick in in 2026. We'll talk more about the details, um, but notably those disclosures are not to be filed with any government agency. They are rather to be posted on the company's website, publicly available website. And then the state, um, the California Air Resources Board, CARB or ARB, is obligated to contract with a nonprofit climate related organization, which will then track all of those postings of plans. And it can call out those that it believes to be inadequate or insufficient. And then ARB would be have the authority, once it develops regulations, we'll talk more about that, to um, enforce um, against those companies that are found to have posted inadequate or insufficient climate-related risk disclosures. Uh, and SB 253, that's one that's gotten a bit more attention. Um, and it requires re disclosing of, of uh, GHG emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, scopes one and two, and also, most interestingly, scope three emissions. 
those reporting requirements and, th and those disclosures are to be filed with ARB, those not just posted to a website. Um, and they will be reviewed and analyzed by ARB in accordance with whatever regulations ARB develops. We'll talk more about that. Um, so the corporate uh, Climate Corporate Data Accountability Act, SB 253, um, those, the first requirement is for ARB to set up implementing regulations. Then the actual reporting requirements begin in 2026 with scopes one and two. And then scope three uh, uh, reporting obligations will kick in later. And again, because these are uh, filed with ARB in accordance with whatever implementing regulations they set up, um, they are subject to enforcement. So if, if they're deemed to be inadequate or improper in any way by ARB, you could be subject to penalties, which penalties cannot exceed more than $500,000. Oh, and notably, um, this re applies to, again, any business entity, private or public, that uh, operates in California that has annual worldwide revenues in excess of $1 billion. Okay. So this is for our listeners, you know, we've talked about the SEC proposed rule, so that one has not passed, but this is actually, um, you know, passed and going to effect. So how do these relate to what the SEC has proposed? Well, it's interesting. You can say that, um, in effect, we have the SEC proposed rule has both climate risk obligations and GHG emissions reporting obligations. Um, here, we've divided those into two different laws. Um, so that's one difference, but essentially covering the same territory. Together, they cover the same territory as the SEC proposed rule. Um, what is interesting, though, is that, of course, there are a number of significant differences. Um, they both track, and, and David, I know, will dig into the details about what they what the bills refer to in terms of uh, the greenhouse gas protocol, for example, for SB 253, um, what the basis is for the reporting. Um, but the key differences that I think um, may bear mention now is that, first of all, um, they apply only in California, but, but of course, with California being the fifth largest economy by gross domestic product in the world, if it was its own country, soon to be the fourth if it overtakes Germany, um, that's a very sizable market. And so lots of companies um, are, are impacted by this. Um, so, but it, it's a state law. It's not federal. Um, secondly, um, unlike the SEC proposed rule, SB 253, applies, well, both of them apply to private companies as well as public companies. The SEC only regulates public companies. So private companies are also covered. And that's, that's a huge difference. Um, the revenue thresholds that I mentioned of 500,000 for SB 261 and 1 billion for SB 253, um, those are not insignificant, but they still, they don't, this isn't limited to just the top companies. It's been estimated that that uh, SB 253 at uh, 1 billion will apply to, to over 5,000 companies um, and that SB 261 would apply to over 10,000 companies. So it's going to have a pretty far reach, even though it's state only and, and even with those revenue thresholds. Um, there are a couple of other interesting uh, differences that I'll get into as we talk more about um, uh, the difference between a state and a federal rule. But the, the other big top line difference to be noted is that um, uh, SB 253 requires disclosures of scope three emissions, not until 2030 or 2027, I take it back, 2027 initially, and then more, more substance by 2030. Um, whereas the SEC proposed rule only requires uh, scope three emissions reporting if either a company has referenced it in its plan, its climate mitigation plan, or those, those emissions, scope three emissions are material. What material is, is a big subject of the thousands of comments that have been submitted on that proposed rule. Well, so you said 5,000 companies, 10,000 companies. So there's thousands of companies out there that are um, 
I hope they're not scrambling. I hope they knew it was coming, but probably not all of them, right? So if people are scrambling to understand um, the implications of what it means in practice and how we actually do that reporting, what frameworks that it requires and all of those steps. So let me pass it over to David to take us through some of the details that in the comparison of, of the two bills. Sure, Caitlin and Nico, thank you so much for, for the very detailed outline of, of both bills. I think it's a pretty exciting time in the sense that uh, a lot of companies have followed voluntary sustainable initiatives in the past as a, as a way to justify their um, a right to do business. And now we've made this jump. Uh, the SEC climate rule had a lot of attention talking about the perhaps requirement, perhaps not of scope three. And now we have a California Air Resources Board setting the, the leadership uh, and the um, running to the top of climate disclosure and risk management um, expertise and requirements. What I would say is companies are already comfortable or at least starting with greenhouse gas accounting. Uh, the greenhouse gas protocol is a standard framework that most companies have followed um, to disclose emissions. And to Nico's point, they're divided across three areas, scope one emissions, which are direct emissions as, a, as they relate to your operations, scope two emissions as they relate to indirect emissions, usually energy procured or steam, and scope three, which are indirect emissions that relates to a company's value chain. That is where uh, the rubber hit the road in many cases because a significant portion of a company's emissions do fall within their value chain. And that is where I think there's a fundamental difference between the SEC and the past bills from California, which is that there's an actual mandate to disclose scope, scope three emissions, or else it's unclear whether that mandate will go through uh, with the SEC. But all being said, um, most companies have started their greenhouse gas accounting journey. Some are more mature than others. And it's very likely that the requirements of the, of the California bills will uh, increase the likelihood of companies going through and aligning to the greenhouse gas protocol, which is the standard that um, the California bills have referenced. Then to SB 261, the key framework that is being followed is the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures that was, uh, if I recall correctly, announced in 2015 after the Paris Agreement. The TCFD is divided into four key uh, pillars, governance, strategy, risk management, targets, and metrics. And in the same fashion, companies have been disclosing with increasing comprehensiveness to this framework that um, has been uh, out there in the public for a bit less than a decade. And therefore, those that are most comfortable with it will be more prepared to disclose against the California requirements. Uh, but granted, there's still a lot of work to be done because it is pretty difficult um, to, for example, find fi the financial exposure to the climate risk uh, your operations might have. So there will be a learning curve and costs associated with both complying with both bills. Um, but starting with those frameworks is a very reasonable starting point for most companies. And yeah, I think I was trying to remember off the top of my head, I think it was 2017 that the first recommendations mm -hmm. came out. The, it was pub, it was established in 2015, but then the first time anyone saw the recommendations was 17. And so, um, and then with the recent, they did an update. So it's, you know, been, what is that, six years-ish that people have looked at and had time to digest what's part of TCFD. So... Um, but it's still not very long in corporate years, you know? I, I so, <laughs> so do you have, I mean, David, do you see amongst your, you know, clients network more trepidation about the greenhouse gas piece or the TCFD piece, or is it kind of an equal measure? Good question. Uh, difficult question, I would say. From my point of view, at least, I do think the greenhouse gas accounting and disclosure piece tends to take a bit more of center stage um, because it, it ties to a company's operations and um, they're, they're, it directly reflects the company's liabilities, let's say, if they become them or exposure to an externality, which right now isn't priced, that being the emissions of carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, that being said, however, the the TCFD framework has been useful for companies to conduct scenario analysis. Uh, the TCFD has given guidance to companies on how to conduct it, and that helps companies understand, okay, uh, how will our business be resilient if uh, emissions continue way past the 1.5 degrees pathway? 
uh, or alternatively, how competitive are we if a government sets a price on carbon or a regulation, such as, for example, the one we're talking about right now. Um, so there, co companies have found value in that, and it also depends on who's, who's leading them at the end of the day. Uh, ESG is a very multidisciplinary sort of requirement across companies, and uh, greenhouse gas accounting in itself requires some deep environmental science um, understanding, whereas on the TCFD side of things is perhaps a bit more on the financial area of expertise. If I could speak to that as well. Um, yeah. I think you, David makes a very good point. And I think often for many, the TCFD is the starting place because that's kind of the, the, the macro level, the planning level, and then all the four pillars that he mentions. But what has gotten the most attention, um, I, I would say, and I agree with David on this, is SB 253's requirements with regard to scope three emissions reporting. Um, the, the US EPA has estimated that for many companies, their scope three emissions can account for over 90% of their uh, of their emissions. So it's it, it can be critically important depending upon the, the nature of the company, of course. Secondly, does a company want to disclose of all everything with regard to its value chain? You know, there may be trade secrets involved. There may be corporate strategies involved with, with its supply chain as well as its entire value chain. So that becomes problematic. Third, and David can speak to this quite a bit more than I can, there's an awful lot of, of uh, debate and discussion and dispute with regard to how to uh, report scope three emissions. After all, my scope one emissions could be your scope three emissions. How, how are you going to you know, account for that? There is guidance out there um, in the GHG uh, protocol, but it's it's far from the, there's far from uniform agreement as to how to do that, and it's very challenging. Miko, that, that's such a good point, and I would say you know the greenhouse gas protocol right now is conducting a review of their scope one, two, and three guidance, and there's some big decisions that they have to be made um, in the next couple of years. Uh, one of them being will they allow market based accounting. Uh, to achieve targets across scope one and scope one and three and going back to your point on scope three i do think yes the trepidation for the majority of our clients is due to the nature of ha not having control over your your supply chain so you can always ask for data be it the amount of money you spent the fuel used by one of your suppliers their emissions but it's a very onerous task and more likely than not you're one of many many customers um, that is requesting let's say that service or product and that makes it very challenging and very, very different to the scope one and two. So oftentimes companies do feel more comfortable with scope, the, the, uh, the assurance, the verification of scope one, two emissions, but uh, there's a lot more uncertainty on scope three and also what are the legal implications for an assured scope three footprint because the nature of it is very, very different, uh, significantly more difficult. On the scope three question, right? So if this is something that we understand the SEC to be, say, less, you know, it's not a requirement unless it's material. There's a lot of subjectivity in the interpretation. Um, but if if this is what ca the California market will demand, um, do you think that that will influence the increase of scope three disclosure regardless of what happens with the SEC? I mean, thinking about what happened with the CAFE standards for um, automobile emissions compliance kind of everyone just did what California wanted because such a great, huge um, car market, right? So do you think something similar could happen in this case? I expect so. I think it will. I mean, California has been the leader, not only in the United States, but frankly, worldwide on climate issues. And, and as the fifth largest economy, you know, most major companies want to do business here. So it's, it's and they will now be obligated to to provide these kinds of disclosures. So I think it's gonna have a huge impact. Um, to dig a little bit deeper into what David was just talking about in terms of the assurances on scope three emissions. So under the SB 253, beginning in 2027, scope three emissions reporting is required at a limited assurance level. Beginning in 2030, they must be at a um, reasonable assurance level. SP 253 does not define those terms. Uh, the proposed rule, the SEC proposed rule does. Uh, essentially, it makes reference to uh, Form 10-Q uh, filings, which are interim finance reports for your limited assurances, and, and uh, 10-K filings for your more certain reasonable 
a, a standard. And also, I should note, SB 253 gives ARB some discretion with regard to how, um, well, first of all, how it will define those terms, but secondly, when those obligations will kick in. So it may be that they put off limited assurance requirements until later than 2027, for example. A lot of details still to be worked out within the rulemaking at ARB to implement 253. And these are precisely the kinds of areas that are going to get very meaty uh, because um, there is plenty of room to, dis to, to, uh, to debate and decide about what is going to be the appropriate standard for those kinds of, assu of assu assured disclosures. Um, and when we say assured, we do mean independent third party assurances. Um, and that's, it's, it's not going to be easy. And the definitions of that are to be determined still. Do you feel that companies are equipped to comply on that timeline? Just generally speaking? I guess that's a question for both of you. I think uh, to, to comply on that timeline is one question. I'm hopeful uh, because they're not starting from scratch. Like I said before, they're building on the greenhouse gas protocol on TCFD. Um, and capacity building has been going on for, for quite some time. Uh, I would throw that question to Nico on the side of can CARB actually build out all the all the rules in time based on the timeline that they've been given, which sounds pretty difficult. Well, so for the first question, um, it, it depends on which company you ask. And that was revealed by the lobbying around the bills. And it was quite divided. I mean, the California Chamber of Commerce, of course, came out against both bills, but a number of leading companies came out in support of both bills. So, you know, the, the business community, as you might expect, is divided on this issue. The question of ARB's development of the implementing regulations, that is a real challenge. And that was something that Governor Newsom noted in his signing statement. Um, he had two concerns. One, scope three emissions. What are we talking about? Um, and two was... Um, he thought it put too big of a burden on ARB to essentially they're given one year to develop implementing regulations for both bills. Um, and SB 253 is the more onerous because, of course, it has lead authority there. It's not just publishing, publishing to a, uh, a website. ARB, in my experience, it normally takes them about a year to go through a normal uh, rulemaking process. The, the rulemaking process for the cap and trade program took multiple years and multiple rounds of rulemaking with both um, the normal 45 day notice and comment as well as expedited notice and comment proceedings, multiple rounds. These are not, uh, these are not easy things to do. They're, California has a APA, Administrative Procedure Act, that lays out specific requirements. On top of that, ARB has uh, additional uh, participation um, methods that it uses. Uh, it circulates drafts. It has stakeholder workshops. There's an awful lot of work that it does. I mean, chapeau to ARB for its commitment to, to democracy in this regard. You can be heard in the rulemaking process, but that takes time. So it's going to be a real heavy lift for ARB to get this done in one year. Now, interestingly, SB 253 does recognize that to some extent. It builds in the option for ARB to give itself an extension with regard to scopes one and two emissions reporting. So that could be kicked down the road a bit beyond 2026 if ARB so decides. Now here's a problem in the bill, and this is something that we lawyers like to talk about. There is not parallel language with regard to scope three emissions reporting. It says that reporting must begin in 2027 and not later than 180 days after a company has disclosed its scopes one and two emissions. Well, what if ARB gives them an extension on scopes one and two to 2027? When are the scope three emissions reporting obligations kicking in? Same time, um, one of the ambiguities to be, to be resolved. All of which is to say that um, the timelines itself could could get pushed out and stretched out a bit. There's no question it's a heavy lift for ARB. It's also worth mentioning, ARB is very committed to, to implementing these climate laws. Um, it's been their number one mission now since AB 32 was adopted and they have a large and uh, in my experience, very professional and dedicated staff. Um, so they, if, if they say, if that's the obligation, they will meet it, I have no doubt. 
Um, doesn't mean they'll do it perfectly, but they will they will work hard to meet it. So we will see something, but there's a lot of details yet to be yet to be worked out in the rulemaking process. And all of that is subject to the legislature perhaps digging back into it. In his signing statements on both bills, Governor Newsom asked the bill sponsors to consider amending those bills in the legislature in 2024. So we could have parallel proceedings. We could have the rulemaking process going on in ARB and amendments going forward in the legislature. That's super interesting. Do you think that there's any any influence potentially? Will the California process influence the SEC at all? Well, funny you mentioned that. Um, about 25 senators and Congress people filed a letter, I think it was last week or the week before, with the SEC pointing to California's laws and saying to the SEC, see, if California can do it, you should do it too, and you should do scope three emissions like they are. So um, we'll see. We'll see. I should also note um, that uh, on October 26th, which was after the California bills had been signed into law, uh, SEC Chairman Gary Gensler stated at a, at a public forum sponsored by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that he expected that um, the rule would not be published this year. Previously, they were saying October. That's obviously come and gone. Um, and he was saying that it likely would be in 2024. If it's adopted in 2024, those reporting obligations would kick in in 2026, the same year as the reporting obligations under the California law. So there would be some interesting synchronicity there. And, and Nico, I'll, I'll add to that and say, even if there's a bit of pushing the can down the road uh, with the rulemaking process, Companies are subject to other regulations that have been built upon the greenhouse gas protocol and the TCFD. There are big markets, one being the European Union that does request greenhouse gas accounting data that is generally speaking aligned to that framework, Japan as well. So for global companies, those who most likely operate globally are subject to the $1 billion um, threshold for the California bill will likely be also exposed to other regulations that require the same amount of information. So there is always an incentive to start working on this pretty much now, uh, because it won't, it's not only going to be the SEC in California. Absolutely right. In fact, the, the European Sustainability Reporting Standards were adopted on July 31, and those reporting obligations for most U.S. companies begin in 2026. Exactly. For those that are already complying with the EU's other directives, they will begin in 2025. But certainly for most companies that are international, 2026 is going to be the year for reporting. So what should companies be doing now? So if, a, if somebody is listening to this and they're an executive at a company that is potentially subject to this, what should they be doing to get started if they have not done anything yet? Like worst case scenario, our listener is there shaking in their boots, thinking, oh my gosh, how do we get ready for this? What, where would you tell them to start? Uh, I'll make three recommendations. The first is um, to monitor and consider participating in California's rulemaking process at ARB. As I mentioned, it's a very robust participatory process and there will be many uh, opportunities to be heard. And certainly it's worth monitoring. Um, they do a very good job of laying out what um, what they're considering doing, and that can be a good road path uh, roadmap to what is to come. Um, so that's that's the first thing in the near term, and that begins in 2024. Second, um, and and David can can talk to this in much more uh, detail, but develop a thorough understanding of your company's climate related risk and its carbon footprint. The two go together, um, and uh, and for that. Folks like David and others uh, can really help, and I and I recommend to companies all the time consider getting um, assistance with carbon accounting um, with professionals because um, it's it's very challenging. And there's you know you can go to the Google and find an app that'll tell you what your footprint is. Eh, query whether that's going to be sufficient, you know, to meet the standards. Um, third, develop a plan, a real plan for addressing a company's climate-related risks and disclosing its greenhouse gas emissions. And when I say a plan, you know, lots of companies say they've got a net zero goal and we're gonna get to net zero by X year. Uh, 
you need to be real careful with regard to um, what is in your plan, what you state about your plan. Um, the greenwashing lawsuits are on the rise everywhere. And if you make claims that are not supported by, you know, by a real plan and, and actual, you know, backed up by data and accountability within your company, then um, you could be subject to, to greenwashing claims. And I'll just close by saying uh, on that note, that's where the G in ESG comes back into play, the governance. It's important to have the appropriate high level folks within a company. Um, fr frankly, it's best to have it at the C-level suite to have involvement and oversight uh, with regard to uh, the development of these plans and ensuring that they are adhered to. Nico's tips. Okay, David, over to you. Would, do you have anything to add for companies that might be starting from scratch? <laughs> I think Nico left the bar very high, honestly. Uh, at a fundamental level, understanding the rules is important. So are you first exposed to it or not? Uh, that should inform the level of effort you should make. And I admire companies who want to do the bootstrap and do the work themselves. It can get pretty complicated. And oftentimes it's not a core business, so it does help to have some external support to go in and conduct a, a baseline understanding and systems of your exposure to climate risk and your greenhouse gas emissions and giving you kind of a roadmap for both doing it appropriately and being able to comply, you know, when the rules may, uh, hit, be it 2026 or 2027. So I couldn't have said it better myself, honestly. The one other thing I could add, which is a big new, uh, nuance, especially with the SEC rule, is why, 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 why is California saying this? Why, are, why is the EU requiring this? It's not just to measure and just tell people, hey, these are my emissions goodbye there it's it's an incentive mechanism because the goal here is you want to reduce emissions right so we we would might touch button upon in the future is companies have to set a target they have to set a target and come up with a plan like nico described to reduce those emissions and it's easier said than done one thing is setting the strategy the other one is actually implementing and deploying uh, technologies and solutions that can help you reduce your emissions to the point of as people in our industry call it, net zero. So you've abated all the emissions that you can within your, your operations and whatever is left, which are unabated or residual emissions, rather you, um, you compensate them with uh, carbon removals. And those carbon removals right now are expensive. They have low liquidity. Um, so co some companies, leading companies are engaging in contracts for, for offtake agreements um, and pre-competitive uh, contracts. However, starting to become more educated on what this means will be important because uh, a fully decarbonized uh, net zero company will be one where their emissions will be very, very minimal when disclosed to CARB or the SEC um, and that they will have some assets within their balance sheet that help remove the remaining emissions that they have. A lot out there, we're talking here about decades of timelines, um, but significant strategic um, questions to have because they're, they're, they're balance sheets, uh, decisions that have to be made. I can't Could think I of a pick better... up on one aspect yeah, there. Please, please go ahead. David mentioned, um, carbon removals as being a part of many companies, um, plan and strategy for retaining net zero. Um, I wanted to just touch on two things because this relates to the voluntary carbon market. We're not talking about it here. Maybe it will be a subject of another podcast, but AB 1305 was adopted by California this year as well. In fact, it was signed into law the same day by Governor Newsom, and it requires disclosures about voluntary carbon credits. Um, and that is going to have a, have a real impact. And by the way, those obligations kick in next year. Um, so that's, that's gonna have a real role. I wanted to just note as well, ARB, um, has taken an interest in the voluntary carbon market. Now they have their own compliance offset market. So that's where they've generally focused, but um, they are there. They've announced one step that they are going to take. Um, and I think there's another that's possible. The one they've announced that they're going to take is to open up the sale. And there were, I should take that. They're going to open up the retiring of California compliance offsets, CCOs, to companies that do not have reporting obligations in California. So right now, only those that have reporting obligations, compliance obligations, I should say, in California can do that. 
but they're going to remove that restriction so that if you are a company that does not have compliance obligations under the cap and trade program in California, you could retire CCOs. The idea being that those would be kind of the gold, uh, I was about to say the gold standard, but that is an existing registry. Um, th that would be, you know, the platinum standard as it were for, for um, uh, carbon offsets uh, to try to bring a bit of, of integrity and accountability to the market, which is uh, currently unregulated. And so there's an idea to try to extend their stamp of regulatory approval, as it were, to at least that small corner of the voluntary carbon market. So that's one thing. I don't think that that could have a terrible impact, I mean, a, a very large impact, but it's, it, I think it is um, symbolic and, and potentially influential. The other thing that they could do in developing, implementing regulations for SB 261, they could perhaps uh, lay out guidance as to what they view as, as sufficient uh, carbon removals to be disclosed towards a net zero ambition. Um, and that could provide important guidance to companies as to which uh, credits in the voluntary carbon market um, meet those requirements and are not going to be subject to greenwashing claims such as the one discussed has been discussed in a number of articles in the press recently. Nico, thank you. And I do think we need a separate episode on that, honestly, because we obviously as Climco have a, a strong feeling on, on all of it and um, feel that the disclosure is actually good for the market. It's something we believe as a you know high integrity developer, we believe is actually really, really good. Um, but I think that's a whole other conversation. And I thank you for bringing it up because I see some really interesting, potentially interrelated um, things happening with with the, the, that particular um, bill and, and these others. So thank you for bringing it up. And we will promise to the listeners a, another episode, deeper, deeper dive on that, if you're willing to come back. I'd be happy to. I hope I didn't take us off track at all here. No, not at all. Not at all. I think it's fully related. Um, and so let me just take a moment to thank both of you for your time. Um, we are really, really grateful to have um, have you on, Nico. I, I know you're such a iconic, in a way, uh, attorney in this space where people really look to um, you and your firm for guidance on these complex issues, specifically all of the stuff that's happening. So really, really grateful for your time today. Um, and David, thank you as always for um, bringing us these great ideas and, and cool guests and sharing your expertise as well um, through our advisory practice. Thank you, Caitlin and Nico. Thanks for having us. I, I enjoyed it and I probably might miss the, the following podcast with you, but I have a feeling it'll be a fun one for both of you. Well, thank you both very much. It's been a it's been an honor and pleasure. I've I've worked with Climco for for many many years, and I have a great deal of respect for you all. So um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Thank you. Mm -hmm.